Good day. I hope all are well. If we could find a seat so we can get started, please, so we can stay on time, I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. My name is Meredith Goins, and I'm the Executive Director of the International Program Office at the World Data System. I'm grateful that you're all here, both in person and online, and it's a treat to work with you all. If I could please ask the technicians to show the slides and please confirm that our individuals online are connected. I do see them online, so I'm grateful for that. Excellent. Hello, Jenny, Anna, thank you so much for joining us online. These are two of our colleagues will be um, online and joining us on screen. We have two others. Uh, but first, let's start uh, with what we're in. So this is the plenary for today. And it is, if we could jump back to the slides very quickly so I can introduce. And then I'd like to jump back to Ginny and Anna here shortly when I introduce them. Um, this session is inclusivity and open science while advancing research, assessment, and career pathway impact. This is a pretty exciting session for us, and I'd like to thank my colleague, Hilary Hannahoe, who is also uh, co-chair of this plenary. So as you know, the UNESCO recommendation on open science um, and, and adopting this recommendation in November of 21, uh, 193 countries agreed to abide by these common standards for open science. And I hope many of you have read that and are engaged in the UNESCO open science uh, efforts. In May 2013, before then, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment was published and DOOR was established. Uh, DOOR's vision is to advance the practical and robust approaches to research assessment globally and across all scholarly disciplines, and which is why I'm so thrilled to see so many different varieties of disciplines here. That make, that's such an important aspect of IDW. Furthermore, the OECD is working with member and non-member economies to review policies to promote open science and to assess their impact um, on research and innovation. These and many other wonderful global uh, opportunities and milestones are fundamental in achieving the needs and the open science vision that I hope we all agree with. But, how can we assure that the defining and development of open science solutions and standards include the principles of inclusivity? How do we all join in? And how do we capture that global movement to improve ways in which research and scientific outputs are evaluated? As some of you may have heard me in my session yesterday with my excellent colleagues, I am more than a number. I am much more complex. And I think each of you are as well. So how can we advance research assessment with an increased focus on quality of research outputs rather than just quantity? And a fit for purpose use of diverse, diversified indicators and processes that forego the use of journal-based metrics. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Eugene Garfield. But then again, I understand he would not be thrilled with hearing us using it this way. The collective global aim is to really support that research practice that we become more transparent, collaborative, and inclusive. Let's work together. Let's find a way to make that happen. I'd like to go, oh, there we go. Next is our agenda. So briefly, I'd like to share a little bit about who we are and who has joined us. But our true focus for today is on the challenges and the urgency of inclusivity as part of the global research assessment reform. What, what are the needs of indigenous groups? We'll hear some wonderful conversations about that globally. And what are the minority groups in, in, in context? What needs to be addressed? There will be a wonderful Q&A session and some discussion at the end that we can have those conversations. Let's continue to build on that conversation. Uh, so first, what we'll do is we'll go over the global research and science communities. Um, each speaker will be given 10 minutes. 
And then after that overview, we'll have a bit of a conversation for about 40 minutes with a moderated panel discussion. And we certainly welcome your feedback, your input, because it takes all of us. So let me introduce everybody. If I could please have Ginny and Anna back on the screen, I'd appreciate it. So Professor uh, Virginia, or Jenny Barber, uh, she's the Editor-in-Chief of the Medical Journal of Australia and Director of Open Access Austra Australasia. Uh, she is an adjunct professor of Queensland University of Technology. And her background, she's trained in, from the UK in medicine, specializing in hematology. She went on to do her uh, doctorate of philosophy at U Oxford University and a postdoc uh, in the US on Godwin gene regulation. She joined, the, she joined the Lancet in 1999. And after leaving in 2004, she became one of the founding editors of PLOS Medicine. In 2015, she joined the Open Access uh, Australia and has been involved in many international open access innovation scholarly communication and research integrity initiatives. She was involved in the final drafting of the UNESCO Open Science uh, recommendation, uh, which I talked about previously. And she was previously the chair of the Committee on Publication Ethics, COPE. She is currently the vice chair of DORA Steering Committee. She's a Plan S ambassador and a member of the CORE's executive board and a member of Australian NHMRC's Research Quality Steering Committee. Jenny, thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Anna, thank you very much as well for joining us. Dr. Anna Ortegoza uh, recently joined the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO, uh, as a health equity advisor at the Equity, Gender, Human Rights, and Cultural Diversity Unit. She's currently working on strengthening and advancing the incorporation of gender and race, ethnicity, dimensions into key national health uh, data sources in the Americas. For the past eight years, her work has focused on urban health in Latin America and where she's developed measures of women's empowerment in cities and explored the relationship with population health outcomes, uh, including infant mortality, adolescent birth rate, and mortality among men and women. She's a collaborator of the World Fair Project, but led by CoData, which I hope many of you were able to uh, attend yesterday, and where she's contributing to describe and promote the implementation of fair and care uh, principles in urban health data. She's a pediatrician by training and from Argentina, holds a master's and PhD in epidemiology from Drexel University. Abel Packer, thank you for joining us. He's the director of Hello. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, I messed that. Uh, program and former director of the Latin American and Caribbean Center of Health Sciences Information, of, also of the Pan American Health Organization of the World Health Organization, WHO. He's a former deputy director of the Computer Center of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. He holds a bachelor's degree in business management and a master of library sciences with with extensive experience in information science, librarianship, and information technology. His insights to Latin America and the initiatives and research assessment uh, involve, there's over 16 countries in the network that he represents, and inclusivity is fundamental to moving that network forward. Maui Hudson, thank you as well for joining us today. He's the Associate Professor and Director of Hecote, close uh, research institute in the University of Wakatao. Close, oh, so close, I'm so sorry, uh, in New Zealand. We, we had a joke about this earlier, my apologies. Maui's research is focused on Maori research ethics and on the genomic research and biotechnologies, the interface of indigenous knowledge, science, and indigenous data sovereignty. He's a founding member of the Data Sovereign Network and Global Indigenous Data Alliance. He's a co-author of the CARE Principles, which we are going to hear a lot about, um, for the Indigenous Data, yes. Um, 
Indigenous people rights and data. He's a member of the governing council of local context and an advocate for improving indigenous provenance throughout. I want to thank them for joining us today and I hope you'll thank me, uh, join me in thanking them as well. So first we will start uh, with Dr. Uh, Barbara, um, if we could bring her on screen. Jenny, I don't know if we could split the screen, please. Jenny, I would be happy to forward the slides for you as you wish, if you just let me know. Thanks, Meredith, that's great. I hope my audio is coming through okay. Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Okay, well, thanks very much for the invitation to um, speak. I'm very sorry I'm not in Salzburg, but I am. I do live in beautiful Brisbane, um, Mianjin, which is halfway down the... Uh, the, the east coast of Australia, and I just want to acknowledge as um, as I start that I live and work on the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people. Um, sovereignty was never ceded, and uh, I pay my respects to um, Indigenous people, um, elders past and present, and acknowledge that the place that I work has always been a place of teaching and learning, and it's I think it's very relevant to the discussions that we're going to have um, here today. So next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk with, I've got a few, uh, no, go back one, sorry. Yeah, so um, I've got a few hats, um, as Meredith said, so I am, I'm, uh, I work at Open Access Australasia, I'm, I'm the Vice Chair of DORA, and I'm also in uh, the Medical Journal of Australia. I guess the main reason, uh, main issues I uh, think I'm going to talk today are relation to open access and to research assessment, but really everything is kind of interlinked, and I think that's a, a, a message and a kind of thought for us to take forward as we, as we think about um, sort of the future of research assessment. Um, I don't think anyone would be surprised to say um, if I, we have a profound problem with research assessment globally. We know that for far too long we've been used to focus on metrics that were seemed easy to produce, the dreaded impact factor and compare, but in fact that we know that these metrics exclude any nuance, they're based on really opaque algorithms and they're superimposed on researchers from outside. Um, by taking this one size fits all, uh, we, we have a it profoundly um, disadvantaged some disciplines and ways of working, such as normalizing the sharing of data and code. It uh, disadvantages individuals, career stages, and in fact, whole countries. And at the same time, because of this focus on single and apparently simple metrics, uh, we don't value whole swathes of academia. So for example, mentorship, quality, collaboration, and integrity in research. Next slide, please. So I, mean, I think it's fair to say that everything we do in research is interrelated. So this is from a blog that uh, we wrote at Dora back in 2020 um, on the intersection of all of this. And I think that since we wrote this, it's just become even more apparent that, um, uh, that uh, through surveys that were done by the Wellcome Trust in the UK and the National Health and Medical Research Council in Australia, um, that there is a, a profound uh, of a survey of researchers that there is a profound problem at the culture of uh, research. We know that culture is affected both for good and bad by attitudes to research open research assessment to open scholarly scholarship and to how we deal with equity um, and inclusion. Um, I was trying to, and we it's uh, clear that without a sort of prof um, profound thinking about how we move forward, um, these are going to remain interrelated and interconnected. Um, I was chairing a panel session for OA Week this morning um, in Australia, and one of our panellists, Welby Ings, who runs EAR, which is the Open Access Roamba Collective at Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand, talked about the need for deliberative leadership for change to happen. It's really clear that this can't be um, haphazard. Next slide, please. So on that basis, I'm, I'll just touch on a few areas. So Mer Meredith mentioned um, the UNESCO Open Science uh, recommendation and I think it's really clear that open science can change the paradigm for research and I don't use that word lightly. Um, it's an example of the really clear international leadership that we need and I won't go to it in detail as I, I suspect many of you are very familiar with it but just to say that I think that one of the most important outcomes of it is that the definition of open science was inclusive so it includes open knowledge, open infrastructure, a dialogue with diverse groups of knowledge systems and engagement with societal actors but it's underpinned by values and principles and then by putting reproducibility transparency sharing and collaboration to its heart it is sending a really clear signal that new ways of working are needed next slide please 
So at DORA, we recognise that biases are deeply embedded in research assessment and that for meaningful change, um, this has to be addressed. Um, our website has some really great resources on it, including rubrics such as this that look at research assessment and its reform from a number of different angles. And this one I think is particularly helpful. I won't expect you to read it, but you can you can grab it um, from the online really easily. And it, talk, it talks about the unintended cognitive biases that we all have. So I, I won't go into it in detail, but I'll, I'll pull out two things. So the first one is this Matthew effect. So this is the concept whereby um, resources flow to those that already have them. We know that it's true for individuals, but it's also true for institutions, for projects, and it's even true for papers. Um, papers that were cited more get cited more again. The second bi bi bias is worth just highlighting here is the halo effect, where we let positive impressions of individual attributes influence our overall opinions. So, for example, you, you know, it's not uncommon. We all know that we do this. We say that somebody coming from a good institution must be a good person um, or be good, doing good work by, um, uh, uh, by definition. But of course, we know that there are many examples of really problematic cases of research integrity that came from very high profile institutions. So this is an incredibly flawed way of thinking about the value of an individual or an institution or individual project or absolutely a paper. Next, next slide, please. So what do we need to specifically consider in Australasia? So I think the first thing I would just say for Australia and New Zealand is that it's important to note that we have very rich indigenous cultures whose ways of scholarship do not necessarily fit into the norms of what we might be familiar with um, in Western research. And I'm talking myself here as, as a non-indigenous person. And worse than that, we know that current practices actually exclude Indigenous researchers. It can be the case, for example, it's hard for them to publish their research in journals that are appropriate for their discipline, possibly because the methodology simply doesn't fit into what's accepted at, at, a, at a particular journal. And I've seen this as an issue uh, at the journal, at the Medical Journal of Australia, where, where I work. I think the other thing just to note is that current norms of um, for example, in data sharing or co-design that are needed and are expected in Indigenous research are not well understood in the current research systems, again, that many of us operate in. And I'll touch on one of these um, in a moment. So next, next slide, please. So what are some solutions? So I th coming back to this idea of deliberative leadership, it's incredibly important what our institutions do in this space. I want to highlight here just one example that has come from Queensland University of Technology, QUT, where I'm now an adjunct professor and until last year I was the co-lead for the Office of Scholarly Communica Communication there. So QUT has just signed DORA. Um, this is a result of university-wide consultation on it um, and I'm really pleased to say that uh, in association with that, a statement is now on the website um, which outlines the principles that how QUT tends to approach research assessment going forward and all institutions that signed or are going forward will be asked to put up such a statement. Again, I won't go into all of this because it's openly available for you, but there are two that I just want to highlight. So the first one is this concept to ensure that assessment practices do not disadvantage early career researchers and other underrepresented groups of researchers. Um, and, this, and the sixth one is providing incentives for research that is locally relevant including Indigenous Australian research and research undertaken in collaboration with local partner organisations and communities. So this is a really important statement of intent and something that universities can be held to um, as, as, they, as they move forward. And this one was, was drafted with, with QUT's um, aims in mind. QUT is just the second university in Australia to sign DORA and one of not a large number of organisations in Australia that have, and we're hoping that it um, leads to others changing their views. Next, next slide, please. So the second, another solution I think is locally led initiatives. I'm just going to highlight two locally important ones that I think are, are kind of instructive. So the first one on the left is called Tufera, and that's hosted at Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. It's the home for open research at AUT. It provides practical support for journals and the repository, but also it acts as a place where the advocacy of the university in relation to open research and advocacy around research assessment can be uh, made really apparent. The second is one is a journal on the right, which is called the Lewitcher Journal of First Nations Health and Wellbeing, which is an entirely indigenous led publication on health, which is being run through the Lewitcher Institute. Not, not only is it important in making the case for research led by Indigenous researchers, but is also developing some really practical examples of describing best practice, practice, for example, in peer review and publications for Indigenous research. And I'm really looking forward to seeing this journal launch and thrive. Next slide, please. Um, 
I won't touch on this because I know that Mary Hudson is absolutely an expert in this, but I just wanted to highlight um, that, that the importance of the care principles and to note that they are now part of the courses that we teach on open research and open access as a routine. And it's a really good resource to have. So last slide, please. So thank you for listening. I just want to make a quick pitch for our OA Week events in Australia and New Zealand. We've got a really rich set of events. We had a fantastic panel this morning. We've got three more throughout the week. The one on Friday, is, I think, is going to be particularly important. It's called Creating Space for Indigenous and Pacific Research, which I think is very relevant to this um, session. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate that. Next, we will have uh, Dr. Ortegoza to join us. So thank you. Hi, good morning here from Washington, DC. I'm just checking you're hearing me well. Okay, so my I'm I'm very honored to be in this panel today. I I'm also feel flattered to to be uh, you know presenting along with many important and relevant people for talking about data and equity and inclusivity. I just would like to give a glance of what's this, this uh, the context of Latin America in terms of data and thinking towards equity. Next slide, please. So in this presentation, we were, this panel was worried about thinking uh, about a couple of questions I have chosen. Uh, three of them that I think are more, are more relevant to the work that I have been done in, 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 in partnership with other colleagues from uh, research and um, international uh, research institutions like the Salurbal project, which is on a uh, project on urban health in Latin America. The Pan Diaspora project is also a current project um, looking at, at the relevance of Afro-descent and indigenous people data in uh, in the whole in the Americas uh, as a continent. World Fair, uh, my current position at the Pan American Health Organization. Next slide, please. So in terms of what are the needs of indigenous groups and minority groups, like, next slide, please. I would like to, to give an estimation of uh, how how is the context on Latin America? We we know that at least 45 million of indigenous people live in 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 the Americas. Uh, you can see in this map uh, the the colors in green are the percentage uh, of the proportion of of people living, and the total is in orange or brown. Um, we, we can see that even in different proportions to a greater or lesser extent, uh, all of the countries in Latin America host indigenous people uh, with the greatest number of indigenous populations. So the variety or number of groups recognized as different among each other are in Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Mexico, and Bolivia. So this um, set up the relevance of uh, the representation of this uh, indigenous people in data. We have discussed uh, so far that it's important the quality of what we also uh, collect about data, but at least the representation is also some a start, a start line uh, for, for thinking about how we in, uh, create inclusivity in data for um, developing evidence and incorporation of that evidence into um, actions and decision making. Next slide, please. In terms of Afro-descent population, what we know, and I say what we know because this is what the data allow us to estimate, there is almost 30, 135 million Afro-descent. Uh, again, in, in red, you can see the proportion uh, that is represented in the population and the total population in blue. And they got, there is also a variety or great spanning of, of proportions uh, of Afrodescent in, in, in the different countries. With Haiti, for example, that uh, the, the, the majority of population is Afrodescent, but um, and others like Brazil, almost 50% of them, uh, and Cuba are the, the three countries with the greatest proportion of population of Afrodescent, but all of them has a representation in less uh, or a um, greater extent. Next slide, please. Although this, this relevance of the proportion of people, populations of Afrodescent and indigenous people, the, the representation and in the inclusion in the, in the, in the registration, let's say, starting from the census questionnaires has been increasing, but not, was not the, the same situation in previous year. You can see in this uh, 
rough timeline that from uh, before 2000, there were few countries that were incorporating the dimensions of ethnic identification in their census questionnaire. And this has been a, um, a work, constantly work and push to incorporate more on these dimensions. And we can later discuss what these are, whether these dimensions are appropriate or not, but mostly they are including self-identification and language as a way of identifying the different uh, indigenous and uh, Afro-descent populations in Latin America. We can see that by 20, uh, 2010, 2010, uh, 11 countries in more incorporated uh, this ethnic identification in the, in the census questionnaire. And uh, recently, um, there are 18 countries, including Colombia, Guatemala, Mexico, and Peru, uh, incorporate, uh, incorporated uh, some ethnic identification in the census questionnaire. Next slide, please. However, when we see uh, sources of health data, this is more complicated. There are challenges that I, we, I'm going later to explain that has to do with the, 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 how we collect the data, how frequently we collect the data. But we can see here in 11 countries where the Salurbal project has, um, has a research um, that um, most of them has census data, as I was explaining in the slide uh, before, the previous slide, that more or less ha almost all of the, the these 11 countries that are Mexico, Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Panama, uh, Colombia, Brazil, Peru, Chile, and Argentina has uh, some dimensions of Afro-descendant identity or indigenous identity. But when we look at health survey data or vital statistic registries, this uh, is much less uh, number of countries that has that identification. So it's not only uh, what, how or what we collect, but also that is that is consistent across the different sources of data. For example, health survey data, only five from these 11 countries has data on Afro-descent identity and seven of uh, from these 11 capture some indigenous identity. The vice statistic registries with is uh, the registration of death and life births and fatal death. Only three countries, Brazil, Colombia, and Guatemala, includes race or ethnicity data uh, based on, on mothers or, or, or the person itself on birth certificates. And um, only Brazil is the one that collects race data uh, on, on death certificates. So uh, this, this shows, I think, the, the, the relevance of how we need to advance on the incorporation of these dimensions in other sources of data so we can um, offer an opportunity to study disparities uh, in, in, in different uh, sources of evidence for, for these groups. Next slide, please. And when we think also, because the, this, this panel was about diversity, and I think, you know, the ethnic di dimension is important, but also the gender dimension of what we collect. We usually, data is collected by, by sex and, so, and just the sex as is identified biologically. Um, women uh, and men are more on a spectrum in, in terms of legal gender recognition and, and, and gender identities. Uh, in, in the Americas, only four countries have legally recognized gender self-identification, which is a legal framework to allow um, how sources of data can uh, incorporate gender identity. Uh, no, none of the countries recently, none of the countries have in the past incorporated the gender identity dimensions in, in census questionnaires. Uh, there were before uh, 2020 some uh, attempts or examples that that are based on household surveys, not even health data uh, in Chile and Mexico. And recently, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile are planning or just incorporated this in census data. And the idea that some countries are advancing on this uh, is, is a good um, sign that maybe many more are coming in the, uh, in the upcoming years. Next slide, please. What I think is this data, even if uh, we are not talking about the quality of the data itself or what the data is representing itself, is speaking about a start uh, or a more a rudimentary need of having uh, some dimensions incorporated to be represented. Uh, next slide, please. 
And when we think about what needs uh, to be addressed to, to do this, I think the importance of the data as a whole, you know, or thinking that the, the different challenges and barriers in terms of the data cycle and, and addressing them in a comprehensive way is, is what, what matters. Um, we know that data um, it, it's a technical, but also a political tool to promote access to services, expand citizenship, and guarantee human rights for Afrodescent indigenous and also sexual minorities. And we see that some legal frameworks and the way we culturally conceive this, these dimensions is impacting also the way we collect the data and the way the, the, the data uh, is is there available to to be processed and analyzed is also impacting the evidence that that advance the the more need or or show the needs of more data. So uh, next slide, please. In this approach, uh, next slide, please. I think one of the the things of how we can move or who are in, in, involved or called to 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 act uh, on, on this. I think that that the I can say that this is a multi or transdisciplinary a multi partnership uh, to move forward this. I would like to here to bring some examples of uh, actions that I think represent concrete um, initiatives to, to move on the, the wheel of incorporating more data at Pan American Health Organization since um, the last decade, there has been an advance on some certain policies like the gender equality policy and the policy on ethnicity and health, which are um, more comprehensive than talking about data, but they incorporate the need of data uh, for data and uh, on ethnic dimensions or gender equality to advance um, evidence and research uh, for, for, for knowing the disparities and visualizing the, the inequalities that and inequities that are uh, in the region in terms of ethnic and gender disparities. Next slide, please. And these are just a few concrete examples. I can talk more uh, during our conversation, but one of the things we have done in the past uh, as part of the Salarwell project is this data brief on making the visible invisible, how the availability of health data or race, da race data on health sources has to do with racism or is as a way to express um, uh, advancement or regress on, 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 on cultural and um, Im impact of racism in the region. Next slide, please. And this allowed the current project that is the Pan Diaspora, that is a data initiative for analysis regional and ethnic, ethnic health inequalities in the Pan American uh, region. This is a consortium of some universities in Canada, uh, US, and also uh, in Latin America that are in, uh, con concentrating or uh, compi compiling the data on, on, on race and ethnicity in different outcomes, including cardiovascular disease, maternal and child health, and vector born disease. Next slide, please. And finally, I would like to mention the work uh, on warfare because this is also um, I, uh, the, at least the work package, which is concentrated on urban health, but in combination with other uh, work package like third surveys or social <clears throat> demographic surveys that there are the, looking at the dimensions, not only about the data itself, but how we do that data more uh, fair and care in terms of incorporating those principles to make the data available, but also uh, recognizing the, 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 the ethical dimensions of the data that is collected. And so we are working also in, in these terms to uh, promote best practices in data sharing and use within and beyond the urban health field. Next slide, please. So for me, you know, summarizing, I think uh, the idea of thinking in inclusivity uh, in terms of data, uh, the idea of disaggregating health data, but ethnic and gender diversity dimension is key for advising evidence on health equity. I'm glad that um, my conversation or my presentation will be followed by Abel because I think he, he can uh, explain more about the, the uh, representation or how this evidence is, is constructed in, in, in our region. The challenges for this goal, uh, as I, I try to explain, are throughout the data cycle and, each, and need to be approached in that comprehensive way. There are 
you uh, a lot of work on data quality or um, data incorporation but I think each of this chain of has to be seen in a in a in a coordinated and comprehensive way and in some countries that the data is already there or the dimensions are incorporated I think we we have a, a challenge that is different from those uh, who are not having this this data or dimensions incorporated but in all of them I think it, this this work on more doing more progress so we know of opportunity to introducing or advancing the fair and care data principles uh, and this is as I, I tried to show with some examples the transdisciplinary work where not only multilateral or international organizations like at Pan American Health Organization but uh, also research institution and international science institutions uh, are, are called to work together not only in in, in the Americas but also across regions I think this panel shows how um, many areas from the global south can get together to to show and, and collaborate and I hope that that we can leverage that from from this panel next slide thank you so much and I will turn over to Abel which and, and my other colleagues from from the panel I'm leaving here my email in case you want to reach out uh, afterwards thank you so much Thank you, Anna. And now we'll have Bell join us. Can I do the, do the presentation? Okay. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, the organizers, for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I will uh, present. I have a problem here because I cannot read it there, and I have a computer here. So please, if I make confused. <laughs> so the idea is to present the uh, Cielo network, which is, uh, uh, let's say, a public policy program that are spread out in, let me say here, okay, yeah, I think I will read it there a bit. Okay, uh, Cielo Network is uh, open science infrastructure that runs today in 16 countries, in three continents, Latin America mainly, uh, with uh, 12 countries uh, in Spanish, uh, two countries in Portuguese, which is Brazil and Portugal, and uh, English, South Africa, and the West Indies. And, uh, we have also a public health collection and a uh, book collection and the uh, preprint uh, server and the uh, repository of data. So it's, it's evolved during uh, 25 years through a real open science platform. Of course, uh, is uh, <coughs> uh, in, 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 in transit to be fully uh, open science modules operandi. But the centrality of the, the, the process is on journals and around the journals to work with the associated uh, uh, research communication. So it's uh, worked <coughs> as development of national infrastructure and the capacities, you know, that is the strategic objective. Uh, we have uh, one national journal collection per country, okay? It works within the national research system. Uh, the idea, the, uh, the objective is improve quality of, of the research communication to maximize visibility and the impact. One or more maintaining organizations. So, as I said, this is a, a public policy program. Uh, 
Mm? One executing organization, one national scientific committee responsible for collection. So this is, is very different or evaluate uh, journals locally, then depending on Caribati or Elsevier and so on. They're different. In this indexing criteria, a peer review standard best practice, relevance, you know, which is relevance to <coughs> mainly uh, sometimes not only research communication, but also uh, uh, local issues. Uh, uh, journals mainly published by universities, scientific society, professional association. So we, we, they are what is normally called community-based journal with highly uh, editorial independence. So the network of this country is a kind of <laughs> collective construction that we did without any formal agreement. You know? So uh, there is a common reason of that, which is to improve the national published uh, research, objectives, principle, governance, and creation. So uh, the first graphic shows the evolution of the collection. We have 16 collections today. The average age in, in, in the collection is 19 years. No? As this is the evolution of the journals, no? and the, the barcode shows the growth, which is, means that we reached uh, in most of the collection, the core collection, and that is the data. So we can conclude that indexing criteria criteria here is very strict, select about 15% of the national published journals based in open Alex, cross F and the other indexes. Uh, the evolution, uh, as I said, is voluntary adherences, evidences the sustainability of the model after 25 years. The evolution toward the core collection evidences the strengths of the model. And I took the case of Brazil that we have a rejection of 75%, so it is very selective. But the process of manuscript takes 12 months, which is a critical problem. Where we are here in terms of the global, no, we don't have the, the numbers there, uh, strangely, but what this graph shows is that the, uh, the evolution of uh, articles published in nationally published journals are decreasing, okay? And they decrease worldwide in 4% in the last year, every year, and in Latin America is 5%. So, this means, in some way, that nobody cares with Dora declaration, okay? Because what happens is the preference to publish in, let's say, high-impact journals or journals that provide a more impact, which is a critical problem for us. So uh, this shows the, <coughs> the uh, again, we have here the, 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 the distribution of the journals and the documents by thematic area. What this graph shows is that varying pay in the countries, we have different distribution of journals according life science, social science, and humanities, and uh, physical science. Uh, this shows the a distribution of uh, language, also the, the numbers are not uh, there. But uh, the interesting thing, incredible thing really, is Hispanic collections. In the last 20 years, they published 82% in Spanish. Okay, and that is incredible because they have an incredible conversation uh, among the countries. You can take, for example, Chile journals, they publish more than 50% of articles from other countries. Okay, and they have 
relatively good impact in Spanish, you know, because there is this regional conversation. Uh, here is uh, <coughs> the, uh, as Anna said, we don't have in the journals or in the research in the index, the identification of the authors, gender or ethnic and so. But here is a percentage of the publication in Cielo journals. Uh, we don't have the number also, but there is an increasing uh, publication of articles related to indigenous population. It increased yearly 21% uh, an average, a uh, six percent, uh, sorry, and the citation they received twenty one percent, and the the field uh, uh, citation uh, relative is about one, so it is very well cited. About sixty seventy percent of the articles receive citations per year. Similarly in racism, similarly in LGBTQ+, and in uh, violence against women. So these journals <laughs> published in Spanish, Portuguese, you know, uh, 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 issues related to uh, national issues, which in general are not properly published by the mainstream journals. So let's go, when we go to the, uh, uh, let's say, evaluation by uh, Scopus or web of science, we have problems, okay? Because we can see that uh, we have, uh, in the case of South Africa, Chile, Brazil, 60% uh, uh, of the articles are below the medium of the, uh, SNP, and when you get a Simago uh, journal rank, it's, it's a little better, but it's still less than 50% uh, below the medium. Uh, when you go to dimensions, we have a better uh, performance with around uh, one, you know, the field citation uh, rating. And when you go to uh, Google Scholar, we, we do have, uh, let's say, better performance, you know, uh, mainly uh, uh, social science and the humanities and, and the life science. I took here, for example, the case of uh, Google Scholar Public Health. We have these international journals with H5. If you take the Brazilian Sciences Saúde Coletiva, Caderno Saúde Pública, they have uh, H5 equivalent to the fifth or sixth uh, ranking here. So they, they publish a state-of-the-art uh, research comparing with these international issues. This is the, the uh, downloads. <laughs> Uh, in, the, in the, the the big bar there is during the pandemic is one million uh, average in, in access unique access in, in account counter uh, per day which is very impressive uh, and the, the graphic here shows for different years uh, the monthly uh, access which shows in the valley is during the vacation time. So what happens is here is an evidence that the journal that Cielo publishes is very much related to the graduate uh, programs in, in Latin America. No? So uh, here is the Brazil system of qualification of publication, scientific production applied to the graduate programs, which produce more or less 80% of the scientific production. So Cielo journals, as you can see, uh, they have a very good ranking in social science and humanities. 62% are classified in uh, part one, in, in A1. But the others are not. For example, life science, where we have very good journal, most of the journal are 
uh, in B1, B2. Huh? Uh, so we did uh, a survey with the, the, the journal editors asking what they think about the system. If they are very satisfied or somewhat satisfied, they selected. So you have a social science and humanities. They are very satisfied with the approach of evaluation research by the ranking of the journals. What not to happen with life science and physical science because they use impact factor. Okay, so life science using Google rank. Here is also an evaluation that we, we do regarding the adoption of open science. Yeah? Uh, so open access hundred percent, but we are promoting <laughs> more the adoption of CC BY. So we are working on that. Then you have accept the preprint. Is there a research data policy or identify the review editors and so on? We can see that the adoption of open science still faces a resistance, but we are growing. So the idea is that by the end of 2025, all journals are fully in uh, open science modes operandi. So challenge we have concluding research assessment as an integral function of the research cycle, how to implement that as an open science practice. So uh, I think that the open science conception need to be included with this function. Uh, and the idea is promote preprinting first access uh, evaluate evaluate after. Uh, we just launched a declaration in support of open science with idea, you know, which is impact, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, uh, where we promote development of open science by national research system to decentralize the approach and the development of the network like we did in the case of Cielo. Research communicated via national edit journal or are of highest relevance in addressing the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. I'd like to apologize when I transferred those slides, the numbers didn't come through, that is my fault. And I will be happy to uh, post the PDF of the correct slides with the numbers shortly thereafter. Please welcome Maui now. Um, I would like to start a, a conversation when I'm talking about uh, Indigenous issues with at least uh, a greeting from an Indigenous language, uh, one of the many Indigenous languages around the world, and this is uh, Te Reo Māori. Um, partly to sort of ground the, uh, not only the topic, but the sort of the scale, the scale of it. And if we're thinking about Indigenous populations around the world, there's a huge range of, you know, diverse communities, but they make up nearly 500 million people around 6% of the world's population. And while uh, much of their, uh, the area or uh, their territories have diminished through colonization and other processes, they're still responsible for over 80% of the, the Earth's remaining biodiversity. Um, and we think about uh, things like uh, the cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, biodiversity that sits um, within those populations, uh, they become a rich source for information and innovation. And I think we saw that um, to some extent in the previous presentation, we're talking about the interest in publications around indigenous peoples has been increasing over the, over the last little while. Um, also just highlighting that this discussion around inclusivity and open science is happening in a range of different places, um, often with different languages. And Anna talked about data equity, and here's another example, uh, um, World Economic Forum, Global Futures Council on data equity, uh, thinking about how um, the use of AI and generative models um, is including or excluding people from within those processes. Uh, similarly, 
uh, conversations and, and archives and library spaces about what does inclusivity look like in the context of open libraries. So whether we're talking about open science, open libraries, all of those parts of the data life cycle are engaging in, in different kinds of ways around the piece that sits as a part of their responsibility. And so I think there's this um, challenge of competing interests. And, you know, we're often in that discussion in the context of ethics and, you know, a number of ethics sessions I've been to have uh, sort of highlighted this. But even within Indigenous communities and between Indigenous communities, there's these uh, competing interests. So at one level, there's um, an enhanced, you know, greater Indigenous participation in research science and technology. Uh, the participation there leads to uh, an increasing interest and in support for open science as well, and the advantages that can come from uh, greater access to information, greater access to data uh, and innovation. But at the same time, um, they're retaining an aspiration for Indigenous data sovereignty or control over their data. And um, I see this reflected not only in Indigenous uh, communities, but often in um, other parts of the global South. Um, you know, I was reading, a, reading an article in the Africa Business Magazine talking about African digital sovereignty and their desire to be more, uh, have more control over the digital infrastructures that will drive innovation into the future. And so here, I'm, so I'm not going to really talk so much about the care principles. Um, it's great to see them referenced by previous speakers. Um, but really thinking about uh, Indigenous needs for inclusivity and open science and these sort of ideas that you, you hear about when you're um, uh, in sessions where people are talking about the need for respect, um, what does recognition look like and how do we create sort of processes that enable reciprocity. And so if these are things, if these are parts of the conversations that are going on when we're engaging with those communities, and I want to try and shift a little bit from uh, the discussion around the ethics of engagement and how we're engaging with those communities to what happens once we come to an agreement and how do we start to embed those things in the digital infrastructures? How do we start to embed those things in the data life cycle so it's not just the people that are engaging that know about it, but it's everyone else that comes to that record? Because that's what open science is doing. It's making the record available, making those, um, that information available for other users. And what does that look like? How can that be done in a way that ensures the indigenous voice remains with that record for all the users into the future and creates opportunities for reciprocity? And so here's this, um, oh, I don't know, this kind of pyramid, I guess, uh, that, um, that we're talking about in terms of the sorts of actions that can be taken to ensure that there's some kind of acknowledgement um, how does that shift and grow so that there's attribution? In the same way, we're thinking about the citation of authors and maintaining, uh, maintaining their voice through digital records. How can Indigenous communities sit in that same space? Where do they sit in relation to um, practices around authorship and um, sort of heard people reference in previous, uh, previous talks about uh, increasing, um, increasing support for Indigenous authorship? And then where do those things then translate into the different sorts of questions around access and authority as we're thinking about as open as possible and as closed as necessary? And where are they involved in the conversations around data governance? So just want to give a, a few examples of what that can look like. Um, just sort of acknowledging that, you know, this in much the same way that uh, the FAIR data maturity model has evolved over a number of years, thinking about care and thinking about how these things can be done will emerge from actually research groups, institutions, and people in different places just doing what they think looks right and moving these, moving all of these um, issues forward. So here's an example, just thinking about acknowledgement, the different ways that um, on sites or on records, acknowledgements can be made. And you might have noticed in the first, uh, the first speaker with Ginny um, gave a land acknowledgement at the beginning of her talk. And so these things are, are appearing in different places and what does it look like to, to have it in digital environments as well. And those sorts of acknowledgements um, 
uh, can be in, the, in a sort of a web environment, but they can also be on, on the databases as well. How are you making space um, within the different sorts of metadata fields that are sitting in your, in your records to allow an acknowledgement of an indigenous interest and where that might sit. And this is an example that's um, just identifying indigenous provenance or recognizing ind indigenous provenance on the European Reference Genome Atlas. And so um, there's a, uh, an ethical imperative when, we, when we're thinking about inclusivity and we think about equity, but increasingly there's also uh, legal imperatives. And as the, um, the, of, um, as the Convention on Biological Diversity starts to integrate digital sequence information as part of the benefit sharing arrangements, it's going to require these sorts of things to be in place. And so Urga and other places are, are getting ahead of the game to make sure that they can respond to what will be new legislative environments um, as well as ethical ones. Uh, here's, uh, here's an example of some of the work I'm involved with with local context and using traditional knowledge labels as a way of reflecting attribution. And so a website which has a label attached, which then the label can be customized to the community and then they can um, have attribution recognized in the way that they would like it to be done. And so when other people are using it, they can refer back to the community in the way that they think about attribution as well. And so uh, that's an example from a, a website. And so this is, uh, these tools are being used in open data environments. Um, and I think that's you know sort of another another important bit um, that it's enabling use by others and it's providing in some ways additional metadata or additional information which will be of interest or use or or useful to other users. Uh, another example of attribution here um, on a national collections database where biocultural labels are being used to do the same thing. But rather than just, a, you know, this is obviously um, an open, open website, but it's within the database and the collection itself and sitting on the record. Oh, and that's what happens when you, you click on it and get the, uh, the customised text. And so this sort of um, thinking about ideas around how uh, attribution is represented or how provenance is represented has then led to an, an example of how do we start developing standards to allow these things to be applied consistently across different formats. And here's a, a process that's ongoing at the moment with the IEEE, uh, developing a recommended practice for the provenance of indigenous people's data. And I think, you know, one of the things that um, I remember in an early conversation we were having around indigenous data sovereignty uh, with a cybersecurity expert from Singapore. And he said, you know, you're talking about rights. And he said, we deal with control. And the things that, uh, the things that um, influence what we do is funding and standards. And so thinking about, you know, what are the places that are, are the areas where you can kind of leverage changes in practice and start to shift things. And so I think this, this is part of our first foray into thinking about what, what kind of standards are appropriate for Indigenous data. And then thinking about um, different ways authorship, authorship can come about. And here's an example of a biocultural notice being used on a database. But what it led to was when that information was then published, um, it was reflected through in the next stage of the chain, both in terms of, you can see the icon there on the picture, but also represented within the data availability statement. And so, you know, how, um, how can we ensure that if we put uh, some sort of indigenous recognition in one place, as that information moves through different parts of the, the data life cycle, that it's present in all of those places and what's required to enable that to happen in, in an easy way. And so one of the things we're doing too is um, got a project with some publishers to start thinking about what kind of guidelines there should be for representing care uh, and indigenous data sovereignty um, within their publishing practices. And here you have another example. This was our first example of a traditional knowledge license um, being used on a, on a publication with archives and manuscripts. 
And so I think, you know, uh, at, at one level, those then become um, sort of easy ways of creating some, some different sorts of recognition. Um, but it does lead to often some more difficult conversations and we're often talking about as open as possible and closed as necessary. And where do things sit in relation to access and what are we doing in terms of shifting data into the public domain, um, making it more available for uh, artificial intelligence. And I don't know if other people have used ChatGBT, but nothing that comes up on there is ever referenced. So kind of the sources aren't being recognized. And if we're not recognized in the first place, we finally get something there, but then you kind of move through this next process and it gets stripped out again. And so, you know, just, just thinking about uh, what are the most appropriate ways for ensuring that some of these things are persistent so that as things are created in the future, as values created in the future, it can be shared in, a, in an equitable manner. And so uh, we use the labels in some way to do that and sitting alongside in conversations with Creative Commons about the best way for the best way for that to come about. And so I think the access, uh, the access conversation is one. And then really thinking about um, what does it look like to support uh, authority, uh, the expression of authority from some of those communities and how does that translate? An example I'm using here is just a future acquisitions agreement uh, which is one where if people are giving, uh, wanting to donate material to a university, uh, to, to a museum, uh, that museum has an agreement with the local community that their first conversation will be about returning that material to the community first. And then after that, if that's not agreeable to the donor, then they get into conversations about, well, it might sit in the museum, but the, the, the IP will sit with the community. Or if the IP still retains there, how will traditional knowledge, so how will the community be recognized? So there's different sorts of, I think, innovative ways we can start thinking about um, more controls being located with communities in the same way we're having this discussion about where the rights of individuals or privacy sit or where they sit in relation to, in relation to data as well. So um, yeah, in conclusion, uh, just something to think about, you know, the different ways in which you might be able to support these kinds of outcomes um, as you're working with data in your context. So, kia ora. Excellent. Thank you so much. If we could please bring uh, Jenny and Anna back to the screen so that we can start our conversation now. We have about 20 minutes left. Thank you so much. Thank you again for joining us. Um, and we're going to go through and start with a question up here to get your minds warmed up. But then we'd also like to take questions uh, from uh, online and uh, from the audience as well. So if you could just give us a moment to warm up through one question first, I see Shelly lining up there. So for the panel, and this is for all of you, what hasn't been mentioned? What are we missing when it comes to inclusivity? I think one, one important point that was not raised is, we think, is multilingualism. Uh, multilingualism express uh, several dimensions of uh, research communication uh, in a broader view uh, in terms uh, not only in the progress of the research itself, but the role of the research in a society you know, the, the, uh, to promote the public policy and so on. As I showed in my presentation, uh, uh, in local issues you know, uh, in Latin America uh, are published in Portuguese and uh, Spanish. In the case of Brazil, there is an incredible effort to publish simultaneously in Portuguese and English to, let's say, address <laughs> local and international people. So I think that the open science brings a new opportunity to raise the issue of multilingualism 
and also artificial intelligence. Probably, we hope, will make all languages the lingua franca of science. Thank you. Online, Ginny, Anna, do you have any feedback for us? Um, well, I just, I just had one thought, which is that I don't think we've talked enough about the importance of representation um, uh, in this whole conversation. I think we've maybe touched on it, but um, and also the importance of capacity building for people that we want to uh, bring on. So, I mean, I will I'll just my, my, my experience of you know, working with Indigenous researchers is something, you know, we're deeply serious about at, at the MJA and across Australia, but there is, you know, the, a, a smaller pool there, than there are for non-Indigenous researchers. It's a, a huge challenge for them to be part of, to, you know, they get called on all the time and there's not a sufficient support for that. And I think that we need to have a really serious conversation about making sure that we support um, the next generation of researchers coming through and making sure that we have proper representation uh, in everything that we do. Excellent point. Thank you. Anna, do you have anything to share? Yeah, just a brief comment supporting also what uh, other panelists have said. It's related to what, what maybe we haven't mentioned or we haven't touched that much, maybe, maybe because it's a little bit beyond our um, scope of, of work or action, but uh, also related to is, is uh, thinking about the incentives or the political determinants of, of this, right? So how we create policy frameworks, I, I think Maui also referred to this, but how we create uh, policy frameworks or legal frameworks that, that allow us more, uh, more affirmatively to you know, incorporate inclusivity in research, but also in data as well. So I think that's, I think, the next challenge in terms of thinking about inclusivity and data and research. Thank you so much. I'd like to check with our local hosts. We don't have anything online yet. We do welcome online questions. Please put them in the chat and we are monitoring. We'll go live. Shelley, what do you have for us? What question? Well, thank you so much. Uh, your, all of your talks were just so inspiring. Thank you so much. I'm Shelley Stahl with the American Geophysical Union. And um, actually, my first question was going was the one, Meredith, that you asked. So I'm going to my second question. Um, I, I get uh, personally uh, working with uh, concepts such that the care principles represent, I feel uh, like very uncomfortable. I am not an indigenous person. I feel the value of, of moving these principles forward, forward including uh, you know, challenges around in, uh, inclusiveness across you know, other uh, communities. Could you, could you talk to how can I be the best ally? How can we all be the best ally knowing that we are, are troubled and, and challenged? Um, hi, Maui. We've been working, I've never seen him in person yet you know, having the right people in the room, sometimes they're busy. And how do we do it? Who would like to go first? Maui, please. Sure. Kia ora. Nice to see you too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's been a few people who I've met for the first time. Um, so seeing them, seeing them offline is a bit strange. I'm shorter than you thought, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, um, yeah, look, so I think, you know, there's definitely, there's definitely a challenge and I think one of the things that we, um, or at least certainly I support, is that people are, are making an effort. When you can kind of see the what the intent is, and you know, at the moment there's there's no answers to exactly how it will play out. And so that's why I've really appreciated, you know, working with the AGU um, and other groups, uh, just trying to think through the issues and think about what could they do. So tomorrow we've got our um, session around Indigenous data sovereignty and the care principles, and part of that is, you know people doing a little bit of a self-assessment and then just trying to think, because we don't know what we don't know either. Um, and so thinking through in what ways um, attribution could be supported or things could be acknowledged, um, that the maintenance, what we're trying to do, I think, is really maintain an Indigenous voice in those spaces. So if I was thinking about that first question, you know, one of the things around representativeness is you're never going to get everyone in the room. Um, but we generally know what things are needed and we can at least try and put some of those things in place and always talk about enabling environments that allow people to come into the room when they want to or when they're able to and then have their voice at that, you know, in that moment in time. 
Thank you. I'd like to see if any of our online presenters, Anna, Jenny, if you have any feedback for us. It's okay if you don't. Uh, any here? We do have an online question, if we may. Yes. Does this work? Can you hear me? Okay. So I have a question from somebody called Jeremy Cohen online. He asks, creating an inclusive environment is obviously extremely important, and we've seen a number of excellent examples and initiatives highlighted by the speakers. However, do the speakers have any thoughts on how to promote engagement from underrepresented communities and groups alongside this process of developing an environment that supports inclusivity? Would anyone like to start? Um, I, th I think I have a, an example, Meredith. Uh, I, I haven't mentioned this in the in the presentation, but one of the things Pan American Health Organization and particularly the unit that I'm working um, with uh, or in uh, is, is uh, the idea of knowledge dialogues. Uh, that is a kind of process, participatory process of consultation with indigenous people and Afrodescents, uh, different organizations and about how they they think they, they, they in the creation of dimensions of uh, rep for representing uh, ethnic uh, um, indicators or you know ethnic dimensions in data, so consultations that are done syst uh, systematically or in time, but at least you know promoting the idea of in different places and in different moments having consultations, but not consultations only with the representatives or, or you know at national levels, but trying to do this locally and very rapidly. I think it's and in a very participatory way. I think it's one 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 of the steps forward. You know, I know I don't think it's the I, I agree that. As, as Maui was mentioning, this is, you know, enabling context and maybe, you know, as much as you enable, there are more needs and different needs uh, that are changing over time. But one example that I can give, at least from, from Latin America, is this idea of knowledge dialogues. Thank you. Any feedback? Yeah, look, I'll just, just, just to add a little bit more, um, I think one of the other ways that can come about too is by supporting capacity building initiatives um, in different areas and, and doing that um, create the ability for for people to engage in some of the things that you know some of the um, other actions that you might be interested in but it gives them the skills to then you know take that take that information take that data and use it in the ways that they want to use it as well thank you jenny any feedback yeah i was i was a couple of things that um that i've i've sort of heard and so i think one bit of it is not expecting anybody for an underrepresented community to do all the work for you so like do the education you know read there's a ton of stuff on what we need to be doing and i think you know the work that maui's done and others you know there's a lot of information out there so make sure you're well educated i think i've what i've also heard is the importance of um you know ensuring that for example, if you're if if you're inviting people in or wanting to people on your panels, or, or whatever the event, whatever it is, um, you know, making sure that it, it isn't they kind of they have the opportunity to do that within the work that they do, so there's not an over, over excess burden. And then the other thing I would just say from I've learned from the patient community is what getting when getting uh, patient people uh, involved or. Um, consumers is not to just have one person but to have a group of people because it can be overwhelming to be the single person um, as part of a representative group so I, I think there's a few things just being thoughtful about the, the whole process is is kind of key I think and I would just note that somebody in the chat has put the importance of inclusivity uh, includes persons with disabilities including visually impaired people and I think we just need to be mindful of that as well Thank you. Excellent addition. I appreciate you calling that out. Would you, do you have any feedback for us? Okay. Uh, we're going to move to in the room now. We have a question I, here. I, I think this one is actually for, for Maui, because uh, you had mentioned chat GPT at, towards the end of your remarks. And I think a lot of people are well aware that it just sort of ablates copyright because it doesn't recognize province of inputs, uh, provenance of inputs. And I think that there's something else you mentioned along the way, which is about digital sequence information uh, and access and benefit sharing. Um, and in the in the current work under the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, um, you know, one of the major uh, changes from COP14 to COP15 was an agreement on a multilateral ABS arrangement and to try to build a framework. But at the same time, 
It was also agreed by the parties that they would actually take track and trace off of the table. And I think the re reason for doing that is lawyerly in the sense that people were saying, it's very hard to draw, draw a connection between provenance of sequence information and benefits, especially if it's in a uh, patented uh, commercialized product. And so I think that that's where there was undue influence of the legal community to pull track and trace out of the negotiations going into COP16. But that also means that I think that it, it raises questions about whether or not anything like meta, metadata that actually reflects local contexts will actually show up anywhere in the uh, specifications for digital sequence information uh, going into the, into the global biodiversity framework. So I'm wondering what, what, you, what you might say and think about that, because I, I feel in this case that, you know, we're at a conference here of the three um, significant global data bodies. And I think all of us here would say, well, it's really not that big of a deal to actually have provenance reflected in uh, metadata associated with DSI. And yet at, that, at this point in time, that's actually off the table for negotiations under the Convention for Biological Diversity. And I sort of see this as being quite orthogonal to everything that's just been said on, on this panel and certainly what you had to say about trying to bring DSI into the access and benefit sharing uh, under Nagoya. So I wonder if you just have any comments about that or what you see on the horizon. Sure, sure, there was, there was a lot there. Um, <laughs> actually, probably, probably coming to International Data Week and, and, and hanging out with these organizations has helped me. I mean, I started as a physiotherapist, so I don't know how I ended up here. Um, but, you know, I, I think one of the things was, um, you know, regardless of what happens in the political environment, you know, those negotiations will happen there. And I think that there's, um, that's really the, I, I think that's the really interesting thing about this sort of group and, and this sort of body is that we can make change by giving people voices. And I think when that voice then sits within the database in a different kind of way, uh, it affects the way that then the voices kind of rise up into that political space as well. And um, I, you know, I think, you know, certainly from Daniel's point of view, for too long when people have come to these or come into these sort of environments they haven't been able to see themselves you know, they haven't been able to find information that can then enable them or, or support their advocacy into those other kind of you know resource decision making places i see um anna nodding her head and she and I, I could see that you know coming through in the sort of work that she's doing is providing that kind of environment so i think you know we can make changes we don't have to be told about them and I think that's what I've seen. A lot of people just actually, they want to do it because it's the right thing, regardless of whether or not they get told to by, you know, kind of an international instrument. It just becomes easier to embed it when that happens. Thank you. Any other feedback for anybody else on the panel? Okay, do we have any online questions? Okay, let's go next in room, please. Thank you. Uh, Camille Dubek, University of Vienna. Um, I have a question to, to Jeannie, actually. Uh, you showed a slide on solutions and statements of intent by institutions. One of the points in this slide was to recognize the wide diversity of research outputs, including non-traditional research uh, outputs like, like mainstream or so social media, non-academic publications. Uh, I agree, but I have a little problem with that because these outputs are not peer-reviewed. And uh, the thing is that in the academic publishing, we are uh, we all agree about uh, open access and open publishing, but I guess there are no there is no idea on giving up peer review in in publishing at the, at the moment. Can you just share your views on how to uh, how to avoid bias in peer review? Yeah, thank you for that. How, how to avoid bias in peer review, is that the question? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I th it's, re it's really challenging. So, I mean, f first thing I will just say about, and congratulations for speed reading that slide, by the way. <laughs> that was, um, it, it's, the, the, the seriousness about the non-traditional research outputs, I will just say, comes from a university like Q is of particular interest to QUT because they have a, a faculty with a lot of performing arts and such like and it's a real challenge that you know that's not reflected in traditional research assessment i think the peer review um side of things is really 
challenging and I'll, I'll just give you my anecdote at, at, the, at the Medical Journal of Australia. So we actually have um, anonymous peer review, double anonymous peer review, which I was very unfamiliar with when I joined the journal. I started in January because we all talk a lot about having open peer review. Um, and that's where the way we're going, for example, in you know a lot of bi biology, you know, for example, through preprints or you know open peer review at other journals. And I just wanted, I guess, what I've learned is the need to be thoughtful about this. So, for example, I've heard people say um, they're very uncomfortable signing peer reviews because um, they they can be targeted by the people whose papers they're reviewing. So that can be a particular problem for early career researchers. I've heard other people say to me. They don't like um, not knowing who the peer reviewers are and not being able to have them not knowing the that not not knowing the authorship not being known because they like having a dialogue. Um, other people say that's really um, uncomfortable. Um, uh, if you have unblinded peer review, so if the reviewers know who the authors are, you do get this you get this some halo effect. And you know I hear it all the time. People say, "Oh, this looks like a good paper. It's from this group, and so it must be kind of okay." And we know that's not the case. So I, I don't have any answers to it. But I think this the, looking at the biases and understanding your own biases is probably the best protection about it. And just being mindful of what's appropriate for your community. You know what the physicists have been doing for many years is not necessarily going to be appropriate for what you do. Uh, you know, for example, in, in very small research areas. So not an easy thing to do, but I do think it's important to kind of at, at least think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Do any of the other panelists have any feedback on bias and peer review? I think acknowledgement and awareness is a big part of it. Please go ahead. I, uh, just a comment. I, I don't know you can solve the problem of bias in peer review, but what you can do or the, the community can do is minimizing the, the, the bias. No? And uh, I think that as you add multi-dimensions in the process of the peer review, you may succeed to minimize the bias. No? For example, if you have measurement or capacity to measure the reproducibility or replicability of a research, at the end of the day, it does not matter how much bias you had in the a peer review if you succeeded to reproduce or replicate the research. Thank you. Any online comments, questions? None, so let's go back to the room, please. Hello, I'm Rita Belderman from the National Library of Finland. I have a question for Professor Hudson. Um, I was really happy to see the examples of the traditional noise labels on your slides. And recently we've been thinking about related to cultural heritage materials that how could we as a kind of national infrastructure provider could support our organizations on kind of like technically empowering them to do that. And one of the questions we first started to think about that, okay, if we start proposing this to our funders, the immediate question we get that is this now that the system that is endorsed by internationally and, and kind of like on a European level, okay, in European level, we don't have any examples and actually that's because the indi all the indigenous peoples are basically Sami people living in Nordics. So we probably should be le leading discussion on this one. Um, so are there any other kind of like competing systems? I saw there was a reference to some IAE standard or something. So anything kind of like you could give us a backbone where to lead just when talking about the funders that this is now the direction to go. <laughs> mm. Sure, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, certainly, uh, you know, the use of traditional knowledge of biocultural labels is sort of a system. And, and one of the things that, you know, we've been, one of the things that working with it has been actually really good for is thinking about what kind of changes needed to be made in kind of systems more generally. And so, you know, what sorts of what sorts of fields would they be able to sit in? Where does it sit within the digital record? Those kinds of things. And so as we got into the project around the provenance of Indigenous people's data, is it, you know, are we trying to create a field that says labels and notices, or is the field a provenance field so that any tool that gets developed, whether it's the labels or something else that emerges in the future, that, that can go into those spaces. And so, you know, we're trying to, um, 
I guess, work across all of those places, even the, you know, the authorship, um, authorship components. There's a number of um, journals uh, that are saying that they'll only publish Indigenous content now if there's an Indigenous co-author. Um, and those are, you know, these are all kind of um, sort of useful move alongs, but I'm happy to follow up with you afterwards um, around kind of different systems and, and how they're being used. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other quick feedback from the panel? Otherwise, I want to thank everybody for your time today uh, for the, and, and to keep continuing this conversation. We must continue to discuss this, to continue to find ways to build and support change. So please uh, give a round of applause to our panelists. And I hope, I hope you enjoy lunch. Thank you again.